Um, I want you, even before this event begins, to think very hard about something in your life that you wish you could change, something in your behavior that you'd just love to change you've never been able to. And then, who knows, by the end of the session, you may have the secret that you need. Can pigeons read? Now, what we're seeing here is one version of a Skinner box, a behavioral so modification. Here is a, a pigeon that has been trained to respond differently when it sees the symbols that represent peck versus turn around. And it turns out these Skinner box have been used in a variety of different experiments. One that suggests that humans and pigeons are not that different with regard to present bias preferences. So that they created another box like this with two levers that offered the pigeons three piece seeds of, of food versus six seeds of food. You could double the amount that you uh, could eat if you could wait four seconds more. And they would give them this choice. One lever was the three seeds, one was the six seed lever if they were willing to wait uh, four seconds more. And then they repeated this 60 seconds later. And what they found is that the pigeons also had this present bias preference, that if the pigeons were choosing between one lever where they had to wait 12 seconds and another lever where they had to wait 16 seconds, they were very patient. 90% of the time they would wait for twice the food. But that when it was a choice between two seconds uh, and six seconds, they just couldn't stop themselves from caving in and going for the immediate food, even though this was going to happen again 60 seconds later and 60 seconds later after that. Like humans, pigeons also have trouble resisting temptation when, the, when that extra piece of food is right in front of them. But the researchers, when they did this experiment, they noticed something else, that before caving in and choosing the two-second lever for half the food, the pigeons would often uh, dither, and they would peck the wall before caving in, that they, as if they were struggling, realizing that they wanted to wait. And so they, they ran a, yet another experiment where they put a third lever, which was a pre-commitment lever. The effect of this other lever was just to disable the temptation coming. And it turned out that even here, that we're a little bit like pigeons, because about a third of the pigeons uh, would engage in not hand tying, but beak tying. They would hit the uh, disable lever so that they would be able to take action to stop themselves, a commitment uh, from being tempted in the future. And so I'm going to talk today about um, incentive devices and commitment devices that might help change our behavior. I am a, a co-founder of Stick.com, uh, which is a commitment store. The purpose behind Stick.com is to increase the price of vice. That it will change your incentives because, like me, you might uh, put a substantial amount at risk so that you don't regain weight. Information isn't the problem. Everybody in this room already knows that if you want to lose weight, you should eat a little bit less or exercise a little bit more. The problem is that people have the, uh, the wrong incentives. To craft an effective incentive, it's more than just setting the right price. Setting the right price is important but you, you need to attend to other things. The two uh, pigeons are at either end of a small ping pong table. Now we're listening to the voice of B.F. Skinner, the father of behavioral modification. And here he has taught pigeons how to play ping pong, and they learn that if they score a point, they get food. Okay, so incentives can be important, but I want to say that beyond the sophomoric economic insight that uh, incentives matter, other people matter, mindfulness matters, and framing matters. That's what I really want to focus on today. And these are new trainees at Zappos. We are actually increasing the offer to $2,000, but you, today is the last day where you can... <laughs> so that's the CEO of, of Zappos, and he just offered new trainees $2,000 to quit. It's a very unusual thing. I call it a, an anti-incentive. Normally, you want your, your new workers to keep working for you. 
he offers them $2,000 to quit, uh, and uh, he justifies it in part because if you're willing to take that offer, he doesn't want you working for Zappos. The, an anti-incentive works because it's a resisted temptation. And what's really interesting about Zappos, 99% of the people resist this temptation. And, uh, and a very powerful aspect of it is no one quits Zappos after a month or two because you just feel like a fool. You had an opportunity to quit for $2,000, why would you quit for nothing a month later? And, it's, and so normally, even though on its face it's an incentive to quit sooner, it keeps people on the job longer. And one question is, well, where else could this work? One is possibly at an Israeli daycare. There's a famous Freakonomics story about a, a chain of Israeli daycares that said they, they're having a problem of parents showing up late for their kids. And so they, they, they put on a traditional incentive of you have to pay a fine if you show up late. And sure enough, the parents started showing up uh, more frequently late. The story is that, oh, the fine didn't work because it undermined an independent um, uh, norm of, of guilt that if you showed up late, now you were paying the price for showing up late and you didn't feel guilty. I say instead, uh, uh, instead of doing away with uh, monetary incentives, try an anti-incentive. I'm going to pay you uh, 20 pounds for showing up late. But I, by the way, that's coming out of the salary of the poorest daycare worker. And now how do you feel about showing up late? Uh, I'm paying you to do it. Well, the naive economist would say you'd show up even more. But once you take into account how other people matter, this is putting guilt on steroids. Hey, my name's James Herman. I'm from Auckland, New Zealand, and I'm selling my smoking habit on the internet. So he's a, a junior ad exec, and what does this mean? It's an interesting poetry to that, selling your addiction on the internet. Who would pay for that? Well, what uh, Herman actually did, he promised to pay $100 for every cigarette he would smoke for the rest of his life. And what he really was auctioning was the rights to receive that forfeiture. People might be willing to pay him money today uh, on the chance that he might fall off the wagon. And before you bid on such a auction, you might wonder, is he really a smoker? Is he asking for my money and he never has any risk? What I love about this ad exec, he put this clip on the internet too. Your time starts now. <laughs> now, I can't do that. Uh, I can't throw a lit cigarette at my mouth like that. I, uh, in talking to him, I, he has uh, convinced me that he really has uh, smoked 30,000 cigarettes in the past. Uh, but what's interesting, since this auction took place, he's been smokeless for now a year and a half. So one of the ways that other people matter is that they might pay you money in order to make commitments. But in, they also matter because they can help you choose your goals. Instead of having people bid on how much you should pay you money, they might put in bids to help you choose how much money you should uh, lose weight. Here, this is a picture of Rush Limbaugh, and they could have a, a auction where people bid weights on what they think is the, uh, how much he can successfully lose, and he sets out the parameters of the weight loss contract. Other people matter because we care about what they know, in, in Japan, they, you can sign up for a virtual wife to nag you. To tell you the truth, this is, I'm kind of put off by the icky sexism of this, but the fact that virtual uh, uh, avatars matter, real humans matter all the more. And so one of the things that I come away from this, yes, money matters, but if you make a commitment, make sure you tell five people. If the only person you tell is somebody that's going to love you no matter what, it's not going to be as effective. So co-workers are more effective. So have other people who don't love you too much uh, be in the know about what happens. Mindfulness matters a, a tremendous Billy amount. Wilson, the recovering like addict. The worst I've ever seen. So like bad that the entire eighth grade started calling her like Lily, like Wilson, until I made my classroom a like-free zone, and she could not speak for days. So this is the uh, slam poet Taylor Molly, uh, who's talking about one of my pet peeves, um, one of my pet peeves, uh, like-speak, uh, the inappropriate use of like. 
And what I do is a different kind of a mindfulness commitment with, uh, uh, with my children. When my son is talking to me and he inappropriately inserts the word like, I will say disco one. And I said quietly so as not to deeply interrupt him, but so that he can hear that I said it. And that when he says like uh, uh, again inappropriately, I'll say disco two. And in the course of a five minute uh, uh, conversation, if he gets up to disco 37, it is a way of making him mindful of how often he is actually using, misusing the word like. So framing matters. Here's a great story of, of, of a coffee shop near Columbia University in New York. They had a loyalty card. The one that they started with is this loyalty card on the left. You've seen stuff like this. You have 10 coffees and your 11th one is free. Right? Very simple card. At, at random, they gave half the people this other card. After 12 coffees, your 13th card is free, but they pre-stamped the first two. It turns out people uh, got to the free coffee 15% faster, and that it helps if you can trick yourself into th uh, people that you've already begun the process. What does this mean for weight loss? Uh, if you're about to start a diet, put rocks in your pocket on, on the, uh, the first day, because you'll immediately say, oh, I lost three pounds, and that will make you feel better. Rats on a ramp run faster when they get closer to the food. And, that's, and we're not that different. In your talk, and your book as well, it's kind of quite light-hearted. I don't mean that in a disparaging yeah, way, yeah, but it, no. kind of, it feels mutualistic. You know, we're helping each other. It's a communal thing. Yeah. Now, the state is not like that. We don't feel that way about the state. We don't worry about cheating the state a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really feel any kind of sense of moral responsibility to the state a lot of the time. So do you think the state can be our partner in these kinds of change processes? I, I do, and... <clears throat> but there's still going to be a question about how, f how broadly it can um, revolutionize all of government. You could have a, uh, a kind of, the, the notion of voluntary taxation seems crazy, but uh, this talk suggests that you could have a certain kind of an energy prebate that we might say to you, we will give you 50 pounds right now in your pocket if you'll agree uh, to pay 10 pence more a kilowatt hour for the next year on your electrical bill. And uh, it's in a sense a voluntary tax and we're compensating you in advance. Instead of rebates, uh, behavioral economics says that the government should be more interested in giving prebates that, that let people see the money up front if you did a green initiative to uh, uh, weather strip your house. Do you think that we miss something out when we change our behavior because we put in place quite crude incentives. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that people get more satisfaction when they give up smoking because they've thought really hard about it and they want to improve as people? Or it's just as good for your sense of self-esteem if you do it because you don't want to lose $500? I'm an extremist on this. People say, oh, you need to do it for, because you're intrinsically motivated, not because of uh, in extrinsic motivation. But if you, let's say you and I are both trying uh, to quit smoking and you do it through a kind of intrinsic motivation day by day and that I enter into a contract where I forfeit 10,000 pounds if I smoke another cigarette. That act of signing up, what caused me to do that? It wasn't extrinsic motivation, that was an act of intrinsic motivation and why, why I think we wrongly privilege the thousand small acts of, resi uh, of intrinsic mo motivation versus the one large act. Sociologists argue that the late 20th century was characterized by the emergence of reflexivity, that is to say the capacity of citizens to, to, to ha want to control their lives. But neurological reflexivity says, well, not only do you make your own story, but you make your own story aware of the idiosyncratic nature of, the, of, of this equipment in your head, mm -hmm. this, y your brain. Mm -hmm. Do you think th that's right, that this kind of capacity to understand our cognitive frailties and idiosyncrasies is a critical, going to be a, a major thing that shapes culture in the coming period? I, I do, and it's, here's a place where it's easier for government to, to be neurologically reflective with regard to the masses. It's, it's harder with regard to yourself to say that, oh, I have, uh, I have uh, cognitive limitations. And when you're thinking about commitments is you have to uh, not take on too much, not to put too much pressure on one of these devices because of your limited neurological uh, capacity. And it's better to uh, train this 
um, willpower as a muscle, but not to strain it too much. And this does raise deep philosophical questions like, well, what do you mean I don't have control over uh, what choices I make?